Good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Happy to see your face. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got a more robust East Side report for you guys. So I've been doing a lot more work on things. So good. Ooh. Yeah. We can swap notes. I've got, we've got uh, some data pulled together uh, now for the, uh, from the project as well, some baseline data. So, okay. Welcome as everyone enters the room. Glad to have you all with us this morning. Usually during these sessions, we try to open up with a morning question in the chat. So uh, we have been in this COVID reality for a long time. Uh, maybe one or two words that describe how you are feeling about living the COVID life. I like that. <laughs> Stable but tired. <laughs> Any other thoughts on living the COVID life? I'm sure there's a Hi, babe. somewhere. Hi. Oh, Are you going to get the library? Well, I don't know if it's open. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Equity Series. If everyone can mute their mics. And then we are going to engage in chat just by updating uh, how are you feeling. It's going to take him, but it was closed. It opened open till four. If everybody could mute know, their know. mics and phones. Four, okay. And please feel free to use the chat so that you can just, I'm loving these uh, responses. Tired but hopeful. Tired of my living room. I know, I've decided maybe I need a new sofa, <laughs> which I think a lot of people are doing. But okay, we're still entering people into the room, so we're gonna get started in a couple seconds. But glad to have you all with us. Zoomed out, I am too. We were just talking with the presenters that there are some new Zoom features maybe to help uh, keep it going. <laughs> Numb and frozen, I'm loving this. All right, well, why don't we get started? Uh, today is Wednesday, August 19th, and you are in the Zoom room for the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce Equity Series. We are so glad to have you here with us. This work has been going on now for um, roughly two years, and it really is a product of all of you helping to make and shape this conversation so that we can personally do the deep dive and work that we need to make change, and so we can help to create environments where all can thrive, and we can close the economic racial disparity gap that exists in the state of Minnesota. From an economic and employment standpoint, it is a hindrance because we have talent that is not being deployed and we have gaps that really are costly when people are not able to participate fully. And so we've had some serious tough conversation and we like to be in a space where we create community so we can have that conversation together. So your interaction and participation is key. Our hope is always that you will connect with one another and find a group to help you grow and to help make the changes that are needed in your organization. So our session today is on what does it mean to be employee ready? 
And none of this is possible without our sponsors. Um, and we have our presenting sponsor, Bremer Bank. Our venue sponsor, although we cannot be with them, the Science Museum of Minnesota. Our program sponsor, the Bush Foundation, doing DEI work throughout the region. And our corporate sponsors, Allianz Life, Anderson Corporation, Anchor Paper Company, Flint Hills Resources, Land of Lakes, Mille Lacs Corporate Ventures, Red Path and Company, Travelers, and Excel Energy. Our contributing sponsors are Sunrise Banks and St. Thomas University. Our content sponsor is Sankofa Leadership Network with Anika Ward, who is our moderator for this session. So again, none of this is possible without you, but it's fueled by the brilliance of those who come to speak to us. And today we have an amazing lineup and Anika is going to share what's on slate for us and she's gonna drive the rest of this um, morning for us. So again, welcome. And um, I pass the baton to Anika. Thank you so much, Shannon, and, and welcome to everyone. I really am appreciative as always of the Secretary of Chamber, Shannon, for inviting this conversation and hosting. Um, if folks can mute your mics, thank you. I will jump into the conversation for today. So we've been ho hosting a series of discussions and we've had some really thoughtful, lively dialogue and, and amazing speakers who, can who have come in and talked with us about our topic, which is how do we, what is our responsibility as business leaders, as employers, um, as community le leaders to helping to build a more diverse and equitable region. And today we are focused on the conversation on the question, are you employee ready? Uh, and this question is really, you know, we're unpacking it from a perspective of what does it truly mean to create an environment where all people can thrive? So we're doing a whole lot of work to attract people, to recruit people. We want diversity in our, our organizations, but we have to do some work to think about what it really means, uh, not just to bring in diverse folks into the companies, but what does it mean to create an atmosphere, uh, an environment, where all people can thrive and do well. Um, and so we'll talk about how, number one, how to attract, retain, and advance talent, um, what makes a workplace inclusive. And then we'll also talk about the internal and external conditions uh, that need to be set in order to allow employees and to create an environment where employees thrive and stay um, and, and elevate throughout your company. So I'm excited to have our, the speakers today. We will be uh, having a conversation about understanding the employee landscape or the employment landscape. And that will be led by Link Becker, who is wonderful and is the director of Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. So Ling will be able to share a little bit about demographics, the candidate demographics, shifts in workforce needs and resources for job seekers. Um, and also just some of the conditions that we are in right now uh, in real time uh, and some of the, the things that job seekers and employers are facing. And then we'll hear from uh, Rachel Speck and Luce Weisberg from Exchange Employment Resources. And they will share some of the resources that are available right now to employers and talent. So uh, we want to understand the employee landscape employment landscape, we want to be very intentional about leveraging resources that are available to employers and to talent. And then we want to think about what it really looks like to walk the walk. And so the last speaker that we'll have uh, will be Kasim Abdur Razak from Abdur Razak Consulting. And we'll have a really um, important dialogue about what it looks like and feels like when employers get it right and the consequences of getting it wrong and how we set the stage and create, do the work so that we are constantly getting it right. And so really excited to have these folks on the, the line with us today. So I will um, go ahead and introduce our first presenter, Ling Becker, Director of Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. Ling is going to share some insights on the employment landscape. 
Ling oversees a department of 80 staff who deliver workforce services and programs to residents and businesses in Ramsey County. Prior to that role, Ling was the executive director of the Badness Heights Economic Development Corporation, serving the Northeast Metro business community. In that role, she led several award-winning workforce partnerships with local school districts and community colleges. Ling's a graduate of the University of Minnesota Morris and holds a master's degree in public administration from Syracuse University, where she was a Woodrow Wilson Fellow. In 2018, Ling was a, recip a recipient of Minnesota Business Magazine's Real Power 50 Award. So I am excited and grateful to welcome Ling to come and speak with us this morning. Thank you, Ling. Yeah, good morning, Anika. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, um, I was thrilled for the opportunity to be able to talk a little more about the urgency, about the work that you guys are all about as you engage in this equity series um, and give you an update around what's happening in our community, particularly around COVID-19. Um, go next slide, please. Um, you can just keep going. Okay, so as many of you know, um, these are unprecedented times. Um, we have obviously record unemployment claims in the country, as well as the state of Minnesota. This has risen um, pretty steadily since mid-March. Um, we are at about 900,000 unemployment insurance applicants in the state of Minnesota, um, which puts us at about 30% approximately of the labor force um, having ha applied for unemployment insurance. And that actually translates pretty close to the Ramsey County data. We're at about 32% unemployment um, claims per our percentage of the labor force. Uh, we have about, it's probably about 90,000 of our residents have applied for some sort of unemployment assistance uh, since uh, mid-March. Next slide. I also want to talk about um, the racial disparities as it has affected our community when it comes to COVID-19. Um, what I have here is a slide around, uh, this is unemployment insurance again, as, um, as, a, as a base factor for the, um, the blue bar. And the orange bar actually shows the percentage of that group's um, percentage within our pre-COVID-19 labor force. So for example, in the first example, um, our pre-COVID labor force, um, of people who are 34 or under represented 35% of the labor force. And yet that group currently is representing 47% of the unemployment um, insurance applicants. And so where you see those bars um, not lining up, um, that's the disparity um, between for that group and where we see that the biggest disparities in our community at this current time due to COVID-19 is really around age. Um, you would see that bar actually increase if I was going to show you age 24 and under. Um, high school diploma really around people who are less educated um, are experiencing greater impacts. And um, if you look at the last bar, this is probably our most concerning um, situation is our black, indigenous and people of color community are experiencing um, tremendous disparities when it comes to COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. So I've taken that, um, that bar around race, race and ethnicity and broken that down for you in a little more detail. So as you can see, there's no disparity when it comes to non-Hispanic whites. So that's why that orange bar is larger than the blue bar, but in all the other examples, um, you're going to see that there is a disparity. Um, the American Indian number is probably not reflective as a lot of American Indians would choose multi-race, and you see that multi-race does have a disparity as well. And so, um, you know, what we're seeing here is probably one in every two uh, Black um, residents are have applied for unemployment due to COVID-19 um, in Ramsey County. So, uh, we know our Hispanic community has been impacted greatly. And these numbers have to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt, knowing who, who's going to systems to get help, right? A lot of Hispanic, Hispanic folks have been impacted, but perhaps have not gone to um, you know, the government to get unemployment insurance, perhaps because they weren't eligible. And, um, and we're seeing you know, similar disparities around our Asian, particularly our Hmong community. And I would even argue that a lot of this data is probably a little bit even underestimated in the sense that when you think about what makes up um, the labor force, um, that's people who are actively seeking work. And we do know that 
you know, due to uh, systemic racism and different systemic barriers, many people have um, kind of given up being active in the labor force for whatever reason and may not even be counted there. So, um, so that's kind of a, a, you know, grim kind of outlook, but I feel like this is important context for you because even if we were having this conversation and COVID had never happened, I know you guys were all engaged in this equity series and cared about, you know, closing disparity gaps. But I hope that seeing this data around COVID-19 um, on top of understanding what's happened in our community around civil unrest just increases that sense of urgency that you all have to being committed to this work. Next slide. Um, this is a, a little bit different of a slide. It's not about unemployment insurance. It's about actually the unemployment rate. And why I wanted to show you this is really how um, to see how much COVID-19 has affected Ramsey County. And so um, the blue bar is Ramsey County. Uh, the orange bar is the state of Minnesota. The gray bar is the city of St. Paul and the, um, the yellow bar is the metro area. What I wanted to show you was actually what happened as a result of COVID to our unemployment rate. In January, um, Ramsey County, pre-COVID obviously in January, we had actually one of the lowest unemployment rates in the state. Um, we were, had a better unemployment rate than the state of Minnesota and the better than the metro area. Now, as a result of COVID, as we look at this data, as we move down into April, May, and now June, which is the latest data we have, um, the contraction by which Ramsey County has experienced is even greater than our counterparts. And so where we were kind of at a, at a stronger position in January, we now find ourselves at a higher unemployment rate than the state of Minnesota and, in, and the metro that is driven by the industries and the impacts to the city of St. Paul. So you see that, you know, wide um, gray bar. But I think it's always important to realize that we are feeling um, just a disproportionate impact and the people that live in Ramsey County, the, the true diverse populations and the younger populations that make up our community are, um, are, are feeling this tremendously. Uh, we estimate probably about 22,000 low income jobs have been lost. Uh, those jobs would be $40,000 or less. Um, the industries that um, those would impact are probably a not a surprise to you. It's the, you know, the retail, the uh, hospitality events, but we're starting to see some of that impact falling into our um, manufacturing communities as well. And, you know, we do have some concerns around construction as we've been talking to our construction partners as we think about, you know, if there's no bonding bill, kind of what's happening this fall and um, later on in next spring. So, you know, the impacts are not going to go away anytime soon. So there's the, the urgency of the work that we have to do to um, ensure opportunity for all people in Ramsey County uh, has only intensified. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just spend one minute to tell you about our COVID response as a county, just uh, as a way to give you some context. Uh, the county, you can go ahead and flip it. Um, the county received $96 million in CARES funding um, as a direct appropriation. Uh, Kennepin County and Ramsey were the only two counties that received these direct allocation dollars. A lot of the money is going toward our homeless response, our public health response, our, our care facilities, our corrections department. But we also do have $56 million that have been got, put toward relief programs. And that comes in the form of financial assistance for residents. And I, I, I urge you to just uh, as employers to know about these programs, not only for your own benefit, whether it's the small business, the workforce programs, but also the financial assistance to make sure, you know, you work, we're letting employees know that if you, they need help, and they live in Ramsey County, that there are, is emergency assistance to help with rent and other things at this time. And I'm happy to connect with anyone with more information. So next slide, please. Um, we, are, we did launch two new things and they were in the docket even pre-COVID, but the timing uh, was really, I guess, opportune as we think about um, imagining a recovery period here. Uh, we launched a new uh, job board last month and I'll make sure you guys can hopefully get the information and some follow-up materials, but the webpage is uh, ramseycounty.us backslash job connect. It's free for employers, free for 
uh, job seekers and uh, it's a really interactive job board and we're in partnership with uh, the various economic and chamber groups in Ramsey County, including the St. Paul Chamber. Uh, we also launched a new job seeker connections newsletter for residents and anyone can actually go onto our job board and subscribe to that newsletter, but it has virtual events, um, information about, you know, tips on different things, uh, uh, region, uh, jo virtual job fairs, and lots of other information. Next page. Um, I did want to call out that we have a workforce innovation board that's made up of 51% businesses, and that th the role of this group is more critical than ever. Um, if there is anybody in your organization that has some interest in workforce related efforts that um, and has some op wants a leadership opportunity, um, I would welcome the opportunity to connect with them to consider joining our board. Uh, we have a diverse group of uh, businesses that are on the board. In addition, we have uh, community-based organizations and local community colleges and other stakeholders who are part of that work. So next page. And part of our workforce board, um, we have two committees that are really focused on uh, the equity work. One is our uh, partnership and equity committee and the other is we have a workforce recovery committee. And we are working closely with our chambers to uh, develop an idea of how to really amplify and support inclusive employers. And I know you have to all talked, you know, for several weeks about and months about how, you know, to move the dial about uh, regarding being an inclusive employer um, for, for your own organizations. But we can't stress enough the importance of, you know, expressing that commitment to having an inclusive workplace and in the, your values, missions, and policies and doing um, assessment of how you know, you are using diversity and inclusion as a way to influence your work and culture and to provide uh, leadership. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, you know, not to all levels of staff and then to allocate resources just to support and most importantly to sustain this work because um, this work is not new actually. COVID-19 obviously wasn't working for everybody in our, the, the pre-COVID economy wasn't working well for most, a lot of people in our community and it is only going to, um, the gaps are only going to get wider if we all are not um, working toward a more sustainable, inclusive model. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm just going to say a couple things about being employee ready because I know you have a lot of other folks that are going to be giving you a lot more of a deep dive, but um, the best practices that, you know, we're always uh, encouraging is to make sure that you're embedding this cultural competence into your company's DNA. And that involves, you know, making sure that it's all levels of leadership and taking that top down approach to building diversity with um, the leadership that who's leading in the cultural competence. And another um, really great best practice that we've seen in businesses is to really ensure that mentorship programs actually evolve into sponsorship programs. And I know that could be somewhat seen as semantics, but it really isn't. There's actually, you know, a lot of difference in the way that you could build a sponsorship program where um, you help people, you know, through the pipeline of advancement more so than just, um, you know, kind of giving uh, support and encouragement. Uh, next slide, please. I did pull a little bit of data for you. Um, this is actually a, a study that the Minnesota Economic uh, Employment and Economic Development uh, Agency did about, uh, I think, two or three years ago. But they surveyed employers around the state, and I thought this was really interesting. They took some of the best practices around diversity and inclusion that were known at the time and asked, like, how many businesses you know, we're, we're engaging in these things. And um, certainly, you know, there were quite a few that were engaging in none. And um, I feel like these, I mean, I was kind of thinking it'd be an interesting conversation to say, are these really the best practices and would you agree with them? But I also think just to see what I was trying to compare it to was more the, the, the um, bottom graph because it's the same items, but it really compares small, medium, large businesses and which ones were doing those things. And I, I am always um, so grateful for the Chamber for your work, especially in supporting small and mid-sized businesses, because I think the trend has been that small and mid-sized businesses have really struggled to be able to do some of these things. 
because of you know capacity or maybe opportunity to connect to the right network or resources and so both these slides and we can send them out i don't think we have to spend a lot of time going on about on them in detail but i wanted to just sh uh, make sure you saw that the the role of small and mid-sized businesses is pretty vital in order to really move the needle considering you know the vast majority of businesses in ramsey county are actually small to mid-sized businesses next slide and this is the same thing. This was just more best practices, but again, seeing that, um, you know, if you look at that none of the above, that big green bar that kind of jumps out at you, I mean, a lot of those uh, people with 10 to 49 employees were doing none of these best practices. So next page. So I think that, you know, I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts just around sustainable inclusion. Um, I think we really do have to think about things that go beyond you know, kind of the hot topic of the day and to really think about systemic change within your organization. And I think um, a couple of these that I really stood out to me would be, you know, trying to focus on having your leadership, um, you know, focus on being architects and builders, you know, that we have to do both structural work and behavioral work within our organizations. And also the other one that I really um, like um, is around the idea of metrics. I know that um, like any, you know, you all have run very um, sophisticated business models in order to execute success for your businesses. And as a part of any critical business area, I think we have to approach um, being employee ready with a certain amount of scientific and analytical rigor to really um, think about how are you measuring that you're able to be successful in what you're trying to do here. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, I just wanted to say a little word about a broader impact. Um, ultimately, you know, it is you know, every company, you know, has some work to do, obviously, as we all do, as individuals even. But I think there's a real urgency right now for our region and our community and our county to really be a place where uh, communities of color and people of color can thrive. And um, how we all work together to do that is going to be so critical. And there's a lot of work being done right now and talking about how to invest in marginalized communities and not so much as just being benefactors, but really thinking about how we can ensure uh, economic opportunity and wealth creation in those communities of color. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that was a lot of material. Um, just wanted to set the context on the urgency of the work that you are so engaged in. So thank you. And Ling, thank you so much for providing that context and the and reminding us, sharing the data to remind us of the reasons why we're having this conversation and, and not just, and the reasons why the conversation is so um, timely and urgent and critical. Um, the record unemployment claims, 30% of our labor force is applied for unemployment. Um, we're seeing the racial disparities continue to grow. Um, and just that data between Ramsey, how well comparatively Ramsey County was doing in January versus where we're at today, the trends that we're seeing are incredibly compelling. We already knew um, before we started having these conversations that what, there was concerning data, there are concerning things happening in our organizations and um, lay, your, your help to lay out that, um, that context is really helpful. I, I'm looking to see if anybody is asking any particular questions. Someone, someone just highlighted uh, the conversation, Martin Luther King's quote about the fierce urgency of now. We are in an urgent space and we have the right people on this line. And so um, I invite people to ask any questions of Ling. We've got a few minutes just to, to check in with, the, with uh, her and, and ask follow-up questions. Ling, I'll ask, uh, the question just popped up, will you be sharing slides? And I do believe the slides will be shared. Absolutely. Perfect. So Ling, uh, as you, sh you talked about uh, the opportunity for employers or people on the line to consider joining the Workforce Innovation Board, mm -hmm. uh, particularly joining the equity committees, Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the opportunity to consider doing, like revisiting as an organization and being clear about your commitment to equity, doing an assessment of our mission, vision, values, and, and making sure, and our policies and making sure equity is embedded in them. 
uh, mm -hmm. evaluating our culture, evaluating the trainings that we offer. Are there any other um, actions that you recommend that employers take right now uh, based on the information that you're sharing? Anything else that they can do to become employee ready? Um, you know, I think it's just really trying to, um, you know, engage with, and I think Kasim will talk about this. I mean, I think really understanding how the, the employees of color who are in your business, how are they doing at this time? I mean, we've been checking in with even our employees. I mean, this is, you know, as we went through the COVID situation and the uh, time of civil unrest, I mean, I made a point to call a lot of our uh, black employees one-on-one -on -one and just check in and say, how are you doing? I mean, folks live in these communities. Folks have families in these communities. I mean, we need to just make sure that we are not so far removed from hearing from people on a personal level and just trying to create like kind of systems and policies and, you know, collaborative groups to talk, but to really do that one-on-one -on -one you know, reach out and, and it goes beyond just black employees. I mean, we've been trying to, you know, again, I mean, I don't think everyone, you know, depends on how big your department or who you're managing is, but I think it really means a lot for leaders to take the time to uh, make a phone call. And especially in this COVID time, you know, I mean, it's a lot easier even just to send an email, but I think hearing a voice and saying, you know, I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. How's the telework environment working for you? I mean, staff have really appreciated that type of um, feedback, you know, or opportunity to give feedback. So I think that's important. Thanks for sharing that. I, I, we do forget just to walk up to people and ask them. I think it's important that employers think about how, because if you don't have relationships with people, it might feel really awkward to go and reach back to people that you're not connected with. But being in the practice of having those types of conversations with people on a regular basis makes it not awkward in the moments where uh, something unusual happens to reach back out to people because they you've already got those types of relationships you should do that for everyone but of course in these moments the lack of relationship with people of color in your organization or the lack of ability to just ask folks how it's going um, mm -hmm. will cause people to probably hesitate mm -hmm. before engaging in that conversation so thank you for bringing that up uh, there's a question from Allison Brown hi Allison uh, you suggested using metrics with organizations. So are there any metrics that you would suggest in particular or recommend for organizations that are thinking about that level of accountability? Yeah, I have, um, I had a link on there um, on my slides, but I can certainly share some more. But I think it is really understanding, you know, like what are those retention rates that you're trying to keep? You know, what are the um, satisfaction rates of your employees of color and you know, what is the feedback that they're going to be able to give you? I mean, I think it is a lot of boots on the ground data, not so much how many people, um, you know, I think it's both behave, like kind of understanding people's, and Kasim again, it will get drilled down in more of like the real life practical um, application. But I think there's the, the official HR kind of reports, right, where we're measuring how many people we've hired, how long have they stayed and all of that. But I think you can drill down as an organization to try to get more at how are how are those people really um, feeling in 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 their roles? Do they feel um, empowered to say things in meetings? Do they feel comfortable? You know, I think I mean those are harder things to measure, but I think as organizations we have to think about how we get beyond those surface area measures to say we've checked off the boxes. At Ramsey County, one thing that I find is an interesting measure is um, we look at promotional rates as like kind of people of color to see how many people have applied for jobs internally that have then. Um, so I think it's kind of drilling down to that next level, right? The metrics are, uh, the key would be to think about, you might already have metrics, but do they get down to a, a, a level of analysis that you really can see you're making an impact? Or is it uh, um, a measure of just kind of a snapshot of, of, of a, a point in time that we did X? Does that, I hope that makes a little sense. So. That does, and I, th I think um, the HR data that we get, the employee uh, satisfaction surveys or employee engagement surveys that we, we review on a yearly basis or however often your organization reviews it, it's interesting some organizations actually don't find that data and disaggregate it so they can look mm -hmm. at, you know, mm -hmm. people of color or our black employees or 
indigenous employees to make sure that we're understanding what's happening with people. Not only, you know, are we hiring, retaining, promoting folks, but also looking at who we're letting go of and making sure, because when there is, uh, when there is a pattern, we've got to look at it. Oftentimes we, we know there's a pattern, but we think it's just a coincidence, but we've always got to pay attention to that. And then having relationships with people, having mm -hmm. the conversations helps us get the uh, background, the context around mm -hmm. what the data, the data is trying to tell us. Because otherwise, if we're not collecting feedback directly from people, um, we'll, we'll create our own stories around that data and make it mean something that makes us feel better. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, I did want to, Anika, just as a kind of a last exercise, I don't know how much time I have, but I was going to read you guys this quote, and then I just want you to guess who said this, because I just think it's so, I, it just floored me when I read it. Um, it says, humanity is beautiful and almost infinitely diverse. The bonds of our common humanity must overcome the divisiveness of our fears and prejudices. We have seen that silence can be as deadly as violence. People of power privilege and moral conscience must stand up and say no more to racially to a racially discriminatory system immoral economic disparities between whites and blacks we are responsible for creating a world of peace and equity equality for ourselves and future generations and i just would challenge if anyone could chat who you think said that um i think i was just i don't know i'm in awe of who said this in the sense of the timing so if that gives you any clue um I think my message to you all this morning, why I wanted to end with that is the urgency, right? The work that you're doing, it's urgent. It's more urgent than ever. COVID made it more urgent than ever. Civil unrest made it more urgent than ever. It has always been urgent, but like we are now trying to not make the gaps even wider and we need all to be on the same page. And so I'll just tell you, Jimmy Carter said that quote. I mean, you think about that. I was, I was, barely born when Jimmy Carter was, I mean, we are, these problems in our community have been around for a long, long time. Are we going to be the generation that doesn't let another generation read a quote like this and go, oh, let's try to get better here, right? I mean, I, I think if I could have, you know, we could have said, somebody said this at, a, at, at one of the George Floyd, like, you know, protests potentially. I mean, this was said by Jimmy Carter how many years ago? And I just would urge us all to really think about that in our own personal responsibility to make change. So, Ling, thank you. I want to yeah. just take one, a couple more minutes, maybe two more yeah. minutes, because yeah. a question that I think is really important, uh, highlighting the statement you made about moving mentorship programming into yeah. mentorship programming. Can you give any advice uh, as we close the conversation to organizations thinking about how to make that shift? What needs to happen in order uh, to support people and the organization from a focus, shifting a focus from mentorship to sponsorship? I mean, I think that is such a systemic change you'd have to do in terms of an organization to talk to your leaders about what it means to be a true mentor, right? And to create certain systems where, you know, there is a freedom to open doors for people and to advance them in your organization. I mean, I think every organization is so different in the way you do your promotions. Obviously in like a, a county or government setting, it's extremely hard to do something like that because we have so many rules. But um, I think really thinking about having conversation, I think actually a, a sponsorship program should be, you know, should be co-designed by your middle leadership, um, like people who are in your middle leadership so that they have an ability to help shape and have ownership over what that is. You should ask them that question, right? I mean, really, it, it's not so much like, oh, I want to take you out to lunch once in a while, or, you know, I'll, you know, if you need help, let, you know, let, give me a call. I mean, it is a, a really um, intentional way to say, what is the career path that you want in this organization or within your career? How can I help you do that? Who do you need to meet? How can I open those doors for you? How can I make time to be able to create access for you? You know, I mean, I think those things could be, could be done, but I think it has to actually be bought in by the people that would have to do them, right? Because who's going to open their network just because their employer tells them to open their network? I mean, you know, so... Thank you so much, Ling. I, I really appreciate all that you've shared with us today. Yeah, you're and welcome. I'm not sure if you're able to stay in the conversation. With yeah, the, absolutely. Oh, awesome. awesome. So we will uh, continue the conversation. 
I want to introduce now Rachel Speck and Luke Weisberg from Exchange Employment Resources to share some of the resources available to employees and employers. Uh, first, I'll introduce both of them. Rachel Speck is an in independent consultant who's working with cross-sector partners to transform the field of workforce and talent development to realize systemic equity through technical assistance, capacity building, and program development. Her career experience spans local government, nonprofit, and cooperative organizations. Most recently from 2012 to 2018, she served as senior program manager at Greater Twin Cities United Way, overseeing partnerships, capacity building, and grant making in the financial stability portfolio. While there, she oversaw the development and implementation of a performance management tool for workforce programs, secured a $1 million grant from the state of Minnesota to provide technical assistance and capacity building to small organizations, supporting job seekers facing barriers in the labor market. And she managed several small donor engagement strategies. She earned her master's degree in public policy from the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and her bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota. She's the daughter of a military officer turned international salesman. So she's lived in multiple states and European countries. I love giving that information and then seeing the the uh, folks who share commonalities uh, uh, respond in the chat room. So, uh, so welcome, Rachel and Luke Weisberg strengthens workforce and community development efforts by providing strategic guidance, research and writing support, and organizational development services to nonprofit and public service providers, to neighborhood organizations, as well as other private businesses through Loop Works LLC. Loop Works LLC hasn't ended poverty yet, but they're working on it. So prior to establishing Luke Works, Luke served as executive director for the Minnesota Governor's Workforce Development Council under both Governors Ventura and Valenti. Prior to his public service, he held leadership and management positions in nonprofit organizations focused on employment and housing issues in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. He was a Humphrey, uh, Hubert Humphrey Policy Fellow at the University of Minnesota and is a graduate of Evans School of Public Affairs at the University of Washington in Seattle and Haverford College. Uh, Luke offers research, Luke Work offers research project management fundraising and group facilitation services and they bring strong experience, staffing coalitions and multi-stakeholder initiatives. With an entrepreneurial approach to problem solving, they help clients and partners identify meaningful expected outcomes and then help shape solutions to meet those expectations. So I am happy to welcome Rachel and Luke to this conversation. Uh, we will hear from them for about uh, about uh, 10, 10 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A right after. So thank you, Rachel and Luke. Uh, thanks, Anika. Uh, we can go to the, the next slide. Um, so just want to give you a little bit of background on the Eastside Employment Exchange. We are a collaborative of about a dozen organizations, mostly nonprofits, although Ramsey County and Metro State University are um, partners of ours as well, who are working to raise the prosperity of the east side of St. Paul. Uh, the, the statistics and data that Ling shared at the beginning of her presentation discussing Ramsey County um, and the populations who've been disproportionately hit by being unemployed in COVID uh, those are all populations that are more heavily represented on the east side of St. Paul. Um, and so we're really collectively working together to raise the prosperity. Uh, one of the recognitions that the team that brought the exchange to life really had was that the way that we, they did their work, um, particularly in workforce services, was contributing to the status quo of disparities in employment and income that Eastsiders were experiencing and that they needed to do their work differently if they wanted to, to um, contribute to closing those disparity gaps. Uh, so one of the ways that they do that is to have a single point of contact for employers, and that's me. Um, I'm the employer liaison. Uh, so I work with employers directly on job opportunities that they have available uh, recruitment strategies, hiring and retention challenges, either for particular Eastside residents that we can connect with or amongst your overall team. Uh, and then we also work directly with job seekers on the East Side. Uh, together, our partners reach thousands of Eastsiders every year. So we have a ready network of job seekers who are looking for great job opportunities. 
Uh, we're currently working to get ready to host our first virtual job fair. So mm -hmm. if your company is interested um, or would like to learn more, please be in touch. You can also always share job opportunities that you have available uh, where I'm, I send out um, digest and connect with our job counselors pretty much weekly um, to make sure that they're able to offer um, timely job opportunities to their, their candidates. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the things that the exchange undertook in the last couple of years was what they called talking circles. These were facilitated conversations amongst groups of residents uh, in 2017 and 2018. And we're currently working on updating this um, on a project with Ramsey County with uh, Ling and her team. Uh, but I wanted to share with you a couple of the uh, contributions that residents made as they were talking about work and employment. There's a lot on here, so I'm just going to address two of them, um, but I'm hoping that you'll take the slides away and kind of consider some of the, the perspective that these um, comments make. So the first one there is the one that's listed in green. We need employers to meet us where we're at. They can't expect us to just meet their mold. I think this is really indicative, um, and, and Ling and Anika, you were kind of talking to this just now, right? That, that this is a mutual relationship between an employee and their employer. Um, and this is really about finding ways to um, express trust and relationship between your, your team and your organization. Um, folks really want to feel like they're being invested in by their employer and that they're not disposable. And then uh, two down from that one. Uh, when you're not from the mainstream, you constantly have to play by other people's rules. From how you dress to how you talk, you often feel on your own. Again, this really calls to mind for me the relationships that are really important um, and thinking about in particular staff who may be feeling isolated uh, from their teammates, from their organization. Uh, if, if you're constantly being expected to play a certain role without bringing your own authenticity, to that work, uh, there's a lot of isolation that happens. And, and that's when you start to really see discontent. Um, and those are folks that um, <coughs> when I work with our job seeker or our job counselors, rather, they're really saying those are the folks who are going to take another job opportunity as soon as it comes up for them, right? Those are your folks who are going to jump ship. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> So this slide is um, very dense and it'll come through um, in the slide deck as well. Um, and I share this for two reasons. One, I've been working on this with job counselors and they asked that this information specifically be shared with employers. And the second piece that I think is really critical um, about this visualization and snapshot is that it's depicting the ways in which federal policy has deliberately or um, without putting it into words, but in action, has enabled certain communities to build wealth and prevented other communities from building wealth. Um, so I'll just do a little um, codification for you since this didn't come with a key on it. Uh, the top level of boosts that are in dark blue, those are federal policies that um, actively uh, enabled communities of color and BIPOC communities to build wealth or have access to opportunities to build wealth. The light blue that shows up behind that is the policy that was quote unquote universal in nature or deliberately focused on white wealth building. Uh, and I just want to point out the density there. The yellow line through the middle is really just timeline um, to provide you a little bit of sense of, of time horizon here. And then below that yellow line are really the policies that prevented wealth building um, amongst certain BIPOC communities. So the dark red is indigenous and Native American communities in this country. The brown is black and African American. The orange is Latino communities. And then the pink at the bottom is Asian and Asian American communities. 
Um, and what I think this tells us and what's particularly important as we think about hiring and recruitment and employment is that there is no such thing as a level playing field in this country. Our history has eliminated that from being a possibility right now and we have not redressed um, all of the ways in which uh, our federal government policies have funneled wealth to certain communities um, at the expense of others. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how that shows up in hiring and recruitment on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so these are some recommendations um, of places to look or um, inquire within your company, particularly as they pertain to hiring and recruitment practices. I will preface all of this by saying, um, again, I think um, there are ways in which systems deliberately prevent access and opportunity to certain communities. And there are ways that they don't deliberately intend to do that, but it comes out even intentionally that that's happening. Uh, and so the slides here presume that um, any of the systems or practices in place were unintentional. Um, and that we really are being called, especially in this moment, as Ling referenced, to deeply examine these processes and identify ways where we all can do better. Um, each of these places to get started are things that either job counselors have shared with me, um, and in particular that their job seekers have shared with them as well. Uh, they're by no means, um, there's, there's plenty more to be had that I'm sure you all will be talking about. Uh, so the first one there, again, there's no such thing as an even playing field for as much as um, wealth building policy, as you saw in the previous slide, uh, has benefited and blocked communities from gaining wealth. The same is true of education. And so the first one there is really about taking a hard look, particularly at your entry level positions and understanding where education is required, maybe because it's regulated, or where your company has preferred it. A lot of times, I think in the last 30 to 40 years, um, education requirements have become status quo because they became a way to just reduce the number of applications that needed to be reviewed. But what that's doing is keeping people, A, from even applying to your company, and B, preventing you from looking at the resumes of really talented individuals. So, um, education is not a level playing field either, and, and this, is where, this is where that recommendation comes from. Uh, the second is that research has shown over and over and over again that candidate names uh, have an impact on whether or not those resumes are um, reviewed positively or negatively and whether candidates are invited for an interview. Uh, so this recommendation is, is really just about um, even when it's not intentional, find a way to eliminate um, the opportunity to, uh, for names to influence your decisions around candidates. This can be done by simply having a staff person in HR remove the names from the resumes before passing them on to a staff person who's, who's, who's reviewing resumes for fit and, and screening. Uh, the third one there is really to eliminate and reduce drug screens and background checks. These uh, single-handedly prevent talented individuals from joining your team, again, from either even applying to your jobs, uh, or in a lot of cases, I've heard of folks who just actively don't show up to drug screens and background checks. In some cases, the state regulates and mandates that those need to happen, and obviously, um, those are typically in really important positions that that happens. But if you don't need to have a drug screen or a background check, then I would recommend removing it. And this is, you know, first and foremost, the criminal justice system is inequitably um, used and uh, impacts BIPOC communities disproportionately. The second around drug screens, um, I would uh, be willing to bet any company that you currently have employees who are, would fail a drug screen if you gave it to them now. Um, as long as your team members are not showing up uh, under the influence, I think uh, you can ensure a safe workplace. And drug screens really are a snapshot or moment in time. A lot of employers use 
both of these to establish trust in candidates. And I would just encourage you to think about other ways you can establish trust or extend trust um, in the first place. The fourth one is much more about that culture fit, um, whether or not it's true, feeling safe in your first, um, first few days, weeks, and months in a new job is difficult because you feel like you won't be extended the benefit of the doubt. And so I would really encourage you to think about how you can build a warm and welcoming first week for your employees, first month, and first 90 days. Next slide, please. Rachel? Yes. I, I just want to underscore something that you've, you've highlighted here, that in the end, these are all trust-building measures. And, 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 the, and the, the challenge is always overcoming our biases to build that trust. And that the more you, even if you're uncomfortable with the idea of, of removing or dramatically changing some of your process, even if you just think about the timing of it, um, you could have a significant impact. Because if, if Rachel and I have worked together for a month and I show up late, she's more likely to give me just this much grace because now she knows me um, after we've worked together for a month versus not, right? So it's just about timing and, and, and building that relationship. So just putting a softer lens on this to say it doesn't you know you don't have to upend everything you can just think in little little terms about how you build trust with the people you're working with and you're trying to engage that's all mm -hmm. sorry Keep going. <laughs> thanks luke <laughs> uh so fifth recommendation is to conduct an audit um, are you paying staff in the same position or same level of responsibility equally uh i think research has shown that uh, merit-based increases disproportionately benefit white men within workplaces, even when that workplace professes values around equity. Um, so this is um, a really critical thing. Again, not presuming this is intentional, that um, companies are, or policies are trying to invest more in certain staff, uh, but, but really needing to take that deep look to ensure um, across gender and across um, racial and ethnic identities that staff are being paid equally um, within the same level of responsibility. Um, and I would just put a plug in here, do some Googling on um, the myth of meritocracy. There's a lot of really great data around um, why um, the meritocracy, meaning you earn everything you've given, disproportionately benefits white men. Um, because it discounts external circumstances which impact anybody's success. Um, that, and you can sort of shorthand external circumstances to luck, right? Uh, and so really making sure that um, your company is investing in its staff equitably is really important. Um, and that last one is just investing in your team uh, Ling, I've seen really great um, presentations from you about digital literacy being the future of pretty much all work. Um, we know as well, research shows that not all communities have had the access and opportunity to gain digital literacy skills, um, but that we know based on all of the trends that digital literacy is, is going to be important in pretty much every, every paid role in this country moving forward. Um, and so by investing in the digital literacy skills or the, the basic um, reading and math skills of your team, you're really helping your talent grow and at the same time, making sure your company is ready to grow as well. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Luke, uh, I wanted to make sure you had a chance to check in. <laughs> Are there any Thank you. No, my, my role today was to um, help Rachel look good. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and I should just say that everybody should start their day uh, being introduced at a panel of some sort because, you know, the, the, the introduction makes you feel like, oh, great, it's going to be a great day because look at that. So, uh, no, I, I, think we've, I, I, think, I think Rachel covered a lot of um, what we thought was most important to share. I, I guess I'd, I'd make an explicit plug um, for engaging with the exchange around uh, around your opportunities and around and around in particular 
questions you may have about how you frame those opportunities. One of the, one of the things that we, we were conscious of um, when we were first starting up this work a couple of years ago was that to back to the, the, the slide around employers have to meet us where, where we're at was that we heard from a lot of Eastside residents that they felt like if this is the meeting place where I'm the candidate and here's the job, that there's a lot of requirement and judgment right here at this moment. And that if you could back that up a step or two on both sides, right? If the, if the, if the candidate could ask, what is it that I really wanna do and that where I'm gonna be most happy and most engaged. And if the employer could ask not what's the job, but what work needs doing around here? And what kinds of people would be good at doing that kind of work? And then move closer to the very, very specifics of here are the job requirements and here are the kinds of candidates we're looking for specifically, right? If you could take two steps back on both sides, you could have a conversation about how to make better use of the talent we have available. And that was really the goal, one of the goals of the exchange. And so I, I, I guess I would just say, in this space, if you find, even before you have a job opening that you're ready to share with Rachel, if you find that there's a conversation you, you want to have about how your work is structured um, and how to make better use of the, the available talent we have in the region, we can help you with that in a couple of ways um, and we'd be happy to. So, thanks. That is awesome to know. So you are available to help even think about the position description and require job requirements. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, we'd love to. That's 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 more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So when I was, when I when I worked for the state and I uh, was supporting the governor's office and our commissioner's offices, I on the, just this exact conversation. How do we <clears throat> recruit executive talent, uh, diverse executive talent, and retain them? So and and shape, ship make shifts in our culture so that we can think about or so that folks imagine themselves in a long-term career with the state, this one of the things that I found is that leaders oftentimes just use the job description that was there before. And just like Rachel said, oftentimes people will um, make it just a little, bump it up just a little bit higher because they don't have, not because it's required for the position, but because they just can't, do not want to sort through hundreds of right. applications. And so they just bump it up a little higher and then the next person bumps it up a little higher. And next thing we know, we've excluded a whole lot of the top talent, the people who, <laughs> and so when I would talk to some of the uh, leaders or hiring managers and just ask them a, a couple simple questions, one being, can you imagine, can you see when you close your eyes, uh, an individual who is the best person for this job, who can knock this job out? that doesn't have that master's degree or that doesn't have that. And 10 times out of 10, they would say, yes. Is that person likely to, you know, is that person a person you might be likely to uh, catch if you don't use that? And of course, you know, and so eventually they would all very easily, it, it wasn't even because they absolutely want the best person. It's so that's the unintentional ways that we we support these systemic barriers. So thank you so much. Great. And I would, I would say this happens a lot with entry level positions too. So um, a couple of the companies that I've worked with on some of their job openings, um, they're the very like entry level position, like the first place someone gets started in their company, um, will say needs to have one to three years experience in a similar setting. Well, how do you get that if you don't already have it? And it's, it's not a, like, I understand it as a preference, um, but what that does is it prevents people from applying for jobs, even in the first place. I mean, data shows that um, by and large, women feel they need to meet 100% of the preferred qualifications for a job listing, and men feel like, I think it's like 60%, they feel they have to meet. And so if, if your job description is doing this screening out for you, you're not talking to so much talent that could really um, move your company forward and deliver the kind of, um, of work and responsibilities that your company needs.
That's right. And, and the fascinating thing about it and why I love, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, just this topic, I wanted to like turn on, <laughs> turn on my mic and just start snapping. <laughs> um, because the fascinating thing about it is um, you hear a whole lot of criticism about equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives as though they somehow uh, uh, lower the bar or lower a standard so uh, and and value diversity over high standards and what's actually happening is that we're saying you know what we're doing when we create more exclusive measures for attracting and recruiting people is that we're missing some of the very best talent like if, and if we thought of it that way when you have somebody say can you imagine that you might miss the best person is it possible you could miss the best person for this job by putting that a screening on, right. on the qualifications and they almost always say yes then you know that we it's not about lowering the bar it's about make it's actually about raising the bar mm -hmm. in right place and making sure that we have because that qualification does not mean that that person is the best candidate so i i just very much appreciate this conversation um i'm looking to see so there was a question about oh there's a lot of comments <laughs> there's not questions Anika, this, while you while you read i can just jump in on the the com one comment thread here was around um, you know, regulatory barriers that, that push us to hire people with certain qualifications, even if maybe we don't, you know, we don't need those. And, and the answer is yes, there's a lot of work going on. You did some of this when you were in state government. Um, there's a lot of work going on, particularly at the state and in county governments um, to try to tease out those barriers, uh, those regulatory barriers and figure out where we can um, make some improvements so that those are those can do what they're supposed to do which is be helpful and and protect people who need protecting but not uh be a barrier to getting other people um employment in which they could thrive so um that's a that's a low and slow process but it's but it's definitely happening thank you and i i see one other comment just thanking both of you for your insight uh uh ib one shares that they're moving to forward to advance hiring practices and also view competencies instead of degrees in areas that they can. Also advancing many pipelines to build the education experience and competencies. So I think that's wonderful news. Thank you both Rachel and Luke for engaging us in this conversation and moving this discussion forward. I appreciate your insights and hope that you'll be able to stay on with the conversation for Kasim. Sure. Thank you. So Thank you. Awesome. awesome. So uh, I want to introduce Kasim Abdur Razak. He is the CEO and founder of Abdur Razak Consulting. Kasim is a native of St. Paul, Minnesota, and has served the Twin Cities and surrounding areas for more than 15 years. Through his work in social services and education, he is accomplished in the areas of research, workshop facilitation, service delivery, and speaking addresses. Kasim holds the professional license of LICSW, which he uses to support individuals, couples, families and communities with psychotherapy services. Kasim continues to further his knowledge and research as a counseling psychology doctoral student. He use, utilizes his formal education, natural gifts and life experiences to improve the lives of people and organizations. He's crafted a unique process to interpersonal engagement known as social architecture. As a social architect, Kasim works on spaces and not people as he constructs sacred space for people to learn, heal and grow. His work has shifted attitudes, beliefs, practices, culture, and climate with organizations, within organizations. And he's facilitated change work for universities, community organizations, religious institutions, K-12 education, youth development programs, and corporate spaces. Kasim is going to facilitate a conversation uh, focused on what does it look like? What does it mean to be employee ready? And I think you're in for a treat. I have worked with Kasim. Uh, when I worked at the Science Museum of Minnesota, and I learned so much from him uh, when we worked together. So I just am grateful for Kasim coming in to share with us all this morning. Thank you, Kasim. Absolutely. Thanks, Anika, for the intro. Um, Faith, you got me queued up here today. Um, all right, let me see. All right, I can see it. 
So again, the conversation today about being employee ready. Um, my hope today is really to invite everyone into conversation and, and more importantly, to invite people into healthy relationship uh, today. And so today, my hope is not necessarily to download information onto people, but to really um, sit in the space of really listening and understanding the experiences of other people and to that, to that uh, extent, I want to share kind of the mission and vision of my organization, which is we protect, we promote, and we support. And what we protect is the inherent human dignity of all people. And what we promote is the highest level of health and wellness of human beings. And what we support is people and ideals. That is at the crux of not only what we do, but how we do it. And so today I noticed that some of you have your cameras on and some of you have your cameras off. Uh, Part of what my hope is, is to your level of comfort that people do actually bring themselves into the space physically by turning your cameras on. I understand that some of us are, many of us are working from home and so we're in private spaces. Uh, but as we lean into a conversation and not only a conversation, but a relationship that's really important, it is about bringing our full selves into the space. And so again, my offer, I want you to hear the fastidiousness of my words, my offer. Uh, is for people to bring their full selves into the space by turning on your cameras. Uh, and I will offer the, 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 the other condition or expectation around that is that yes, you are in your home. You saw me turn off my, some people may have saw me turn off my camera twice. Uh, I'm hydrating the day. And so it was very necessary to turn off my camera at times to make sure I'm taking care of myself. So with that being said, I want us to stay right here on this slide. And what I want to offer people again is this idea that my intention in coming in here today uh, was essentially three. As I think about protecting, promoting, and supporting, in this space today, my intention is to really to listen, to understand, to offer people information. And again, I want you to hear this word very specifically, offer, which means you can take it or leave it. I would like to explore, have the opportunity to explore some things um, in this space. And I want to validate the beauty of having the opportunity to congregate in, in the numbers that we have today is that a lot of what I may say may not be new to anyone. And so a big part of my hope here today is to really validate, validate the work that people are already doing. And if anything, possibly give um, language to maybe some of the things that you're experiencing or that you're already doing. And so again, to listen, to understand, I want to understand people's experiences. I want to offer people things, maybe things that they have not considered. And I want to validate um, the excellence that is in the space today. And we have already had the opportunity to listen to several people who have said some outstanding things that I really appreciated. And that in some ways I will be giving a reiteration of some of the points that they share. And so in the, in, the, in the hopes and veins of healthy relationship, I want this to be conversational, which means that the chat is cool. Like that's, that's cool, that's cool, the chat is cool. I'm on dialogue, I'm, I'm, I'm utilizing my voice and I want people to, again, have the authority to unmute your mic and be able to respond to me utilizing your voice. Um, and so it, with that being said, it's like I, you can jump in at any given time during part of this, this presentation or conversation. With that, the next thing that I would like for us to do is Faith is going to break us out into some groups for about five to seven minutes. And my offer is for people to reflect and share on a few things. One is, what is the mission and vision of, uh, vision of your organization? be able to share that uh, with people who are going to be in your breakout. So what is your mission and vision? Two, what are your hopes uh, to receive today? What are you really hoping to leave, uh, leave this, this conversation and this discussion with? And then three, what are you willing to contribute? So again, in a healthy relationship, there's give and take. And so my expectation for today is that as you are leaving with gifts that you also make the opportunity to contribute your gifts into this space. 
So faith, if you can break us out into breakout rooms for about five minutes, five to seven minutes, and if we can share our mission and vision of our organizations, our hopes to leave with today, and our gifts to, that we are willing to contribute to this space with the time that we have left, that would be outstanding. Oh, just kind of, again, uh, le leaning into that process of, again, having some breakout and really putting your voice into the space. And those of you who have turned your cameras on, outstanding to see your faces. Uh, and not apologetic, but, man, I, I wish we could spend more time in that space. And, and I am, you know, conscious of the fact that we have some time constraints. But I was really having the having an appreciation for hearing people's stories and what they're willing to contribute and what they're looking to take from the space today. Um, I will move quickly and not too quickly, hopefully, um, as we have part of this conversation today. Um, that was humanizing. I got a chance to meet a few people and y'all cut my buddy Reed off um, as, as he was sharing. Um, and then there was, I think, one or two people I didn't get a chance to hear from. But I really appreciate, again, the enthusiasm that I heard, particularly in my, my, my breakout space. So why, why was the offer around breakout into the sessions and number one, identify mission and vision, and then two, talk about hopes and contributions. I worked for an organization one time and I was in a, a retreat. I was in a retreat, actually it was a strategic, uh, strategic planning uh, kind of week. And the head of the division came into our department and he put up a grid and he talked about mission versus margin. And he imparted some information into our department. And he said, look, this is our grid. We have mission and margin. M mission does not happen without margin, meaning like this work is not going to happen without money. And uh, he said, this is our grid. You can be a one, two, a three, or a four. Uh, the optimal space was to kind of be high on margin and mission. And he said, not a lot of people actually hit that spot within our organization. He said, what happens is uh, people who are really high on margin uh, and the mission is not necessarily there is kind of where our sweet spot is. The reason why this was the offer is that as we lean into a conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion, however people choose to frame that work in their organization, it will likely come from the mission of the organization. And the reality is that how many of us can ask our employees, what is the mission and vision of our organization? And that mission and vision is alive and active in such a way that people can actually articulate it and show how it's showing up within the workspace. And so that identification of mission and vision was really about that. Okay, I thought brother Drew, did you did you unmute your mic? Somebody's about to say something. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm I'm astute to all things. This is my, my my profession is to be observant. So that was really about the mission and vision. I want us to really lean into that as we again look at ourselves as leader with leaders within our organization is to really think about is your mission and vision alive? Could you go to throughout your organization to ask people, what is the mission and vision? And number one, people, could people even tell you what it is? If not, that mission, again, is probably the rub around the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And again, the other two things that I offered with was, what can you contribute and what do you hope to take away? There is no way for me to even begin a presentation and to hope to offer you all anything without number one, first, figuring out where it is that you're landing and what it is you're, that you're wanting to take away. And so I have to know these things, otherwise I will offer you something that you do not want. And that, that again, will be the, the point of contention in our relationship. And then two, I need to know what you're willing to contribute, which means I need to know what are your gifts and talents? How do you see yourselves positioned in this space so that I can access that gift, that contribution in a way that again, lifts up our relationship. So again, that was opportunity for us to get some breakout, have a little conversation. The reality of that is that that is 
actually the meat and bones of this work. Faith, may you take us to the next slide, please? Now, see, see, this is where I tricked Shannon. Shannon brought us together and she gave us the title. She said, you know, uh, are you employee ready? I am going to ask another question. I want people to now, I want you to access your chats. Um, when you think about this, this task, this, this heavy lifting of diversity, equity, and inclusion within your organization, I want you to be, again, self, self uh, expressive about where you are particularly at. Are you ready? And if you are, I want you to put a one in the chat if you're ready. If you're prepared, I want you to put a two in the chat. And I'm gonna just watch the chat numbers go crazy for a minute. Okay, one, 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 two, one, 1. 1.5. One, 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 zero, one. Oh, somebody put a zero, two, they got me. One. 1.5. This is beautiful because I, I got to watch the numbers and then think about how many people's in here. I'm watching the number go up 81 and so I can see who's actually contributing. That's outstanding. Two. All right. Now, again, this, this ain't a trick question or anything like that. This is really about pulsing uh, and, and, more, and more so it's actually about self-awareness. The question is ready or prepared? Again, some people may not make distinction between those two things. I do. As a matter of fact, I remember the first time that I made the distinction. I was just a young mustache leaving out of town. My first time actually being away from home. I was going to the University of Missouri and my brothers, they took me down. They took me down on the trip and uh, dropped me off. And about six, seven months later, they came down uh, to watch one of my basketball games. I was a basketball player, a scholarship athlete. And so older brother comes down, as brothers do when we get together, we start hazing, going back and forth with one another. And my older brother says, essentially that, you know, Kasim, you think you're a great athlete, but I I'll still beat you in a race. And I said, and, I, and, and then he said something right after that. He said, and I'm ready right now. And I laughed, I laughed, like I laughed. And I, and I looked at him. And I said, you're ready, but I'm prepared. I said, you're ready, but I'm prepared. He said, man, get your shoes on. We go outside, end of the block, you know, old school style, end of the block, other brothers standing at the other end. On your mark, get set, we take off. And, and, and again, I don't know. But I took off so fast that he was still standing there. I'm halfway up the block. He said, no, 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 come back, man, come back. We reset again. On your mark, get set. I take off. I mean, it's not even close. It's not even close. At the end of it, we get to the end. Again, this is an older brother. So again, this is a person who I'm used to imparting wisdom. This is who I learned at the foot of. And I said, the difference is you were ready. You had the affective, the emotional disposition to carry out this, 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 this activity. I've been down here for the last six months, man. I've been doing two a days. I've been running, I've been doing weights. I've paid the tax. I've paid the tax that you haven't paid. And so I'm beyond ready, I'm prepared. And this is important because I want us to understand that there is a difference between being ready and being prepared. And as we lean into things that are very difficult and challenging, like diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to make the distinction between being ready and being prepared. Why? Because if we're ready and we're not prepared and we think we're prepared, but we're actually ready, 
it could have consequences for those people who are counting on us. And so again, this is not about one being better than the other. This is about self-awareness. Where are we at? And are we in reality about where we're at and what that actually means for us? Because uh, trust me, I really appreciated that my brother was ready. Um, and I also understood that him being ready, him having the emotional disposition to race me was not going to get the job done. He needed to pay a tax and he hadn't paid it. And I had been paying it for six or seven months. Shannon, take us forward. I want us to lean in a little bit now. I mean, I'm sorry, not Shannon. I'm looking at Shannon's face, uh, Faith. So employees in the workplace, employees in the workplace, one of the things that I want to offer today is I want to offer language for some of the things that some other people have already shared today. And not only do I want to share and offer language, but schema to maybe how do we might think about these things as we are moving about within our organizations. And what I want to share is something called the theory of work adjustment. Um, this is back from the 80s that this, this actually came out. Faith, take us to the next slide, please. So the theory of, of work adjustment essentially says that there are three things that need to happen in an organization or two in particular. And one is satisfaction. Satisfaction is when the person's or the employee's needs are met. When employees' needs are met, they feel satisfied and so satisfaction occurs. Satisfactoriness is about the needs of the environment, which means the needs of the employer and when the employer's needs are being met, that the, in, that the institution experiences satisfactoriness. And so when you take satisfaction and satisfactoriness, when those two things are married, both of those things are happening, you get something that's called correspondence. Correspondence means we are all happy. We are within the bosom of love. And this is, again, this is one of the things when we talk about things like retention, retention is based upon these things happening, that the employee is satisfied and that the employer is also satisfied. And this shows up in, again, very fastidious with the words, the needs, the needs, not the wants, the needs of the employer are met and the needs of the employer or the institution is met. However, next slide, please, Faith. Correspondence is not something that happens necessarily because people come in and they've been vetted through the hiring process. Um, a lot of times what happens is adjustment and adjustment can essentially happen in one of two ways. You can have active adjustment and this active adjust adjustment can work two ways, either from the employee or from the employer. And what active adjustment is, is when the person attempts to change the environment. So this is the person saying, this isn't really a good fit. I have some needs that are not being met. And so they actively try to work on the environment, meaning the institution to get their needs met. The other way active adjustment can happen is when the environment says, you know what? We have some, satisfactor some satisfactoriness needs. So this is the employer saying, there's some needs that are not being met and we need to actually try to change the person. And so that adjustment kind of can happen in that way, this active adjustment. The other way that it can also happen is reactive adjustment. This is where the person may attempt to change themselves, change themselves, their behavior to be a better fit for the environment or for the employer. Conversely, the environment or the employer can try to attempt to change the responsibilities um, or the work environment to fit the person. These are two very important concepts. And again, this is not a right or wrong thing. These are things that happen within our workspaces. We have active or reactive adjustment. And again, these things can occur um, as an employee initiated response and or as an employer initiated response. And so as we look at these ideals of adjustment, we say, okay, what happens next? Um, and one of the things that we have to understand is that when adjustment occurs 
in a way that that is mutually beneficial, then we go back to this ideal of correspondence again. And so that means that the needs of the employee, needs of the employer are both being met. And so now we're back in this bosom of love. However, next slide, please, Faith. Unsuccessful adjustment. It shows up as persistence. And this is when adjustment attempts um, have been unsuccessful. And typically what we see is this is where now we're talking about uh, the inability to retain employees. So it doesn't matter if the employee actively adjusted or attempted to actively adjust, act, uh, reactively adjust, or if the employer was part of the active readjustment or reactive uh, adjustment, the reality is that the attempts didn't work. And so now what we have is the employee no longer um, is able to be in that space in a healthy way. And so either the employer says we need to kind of part ways or the employee themselves says this is not a fit for me. And so either way it shows up in our retention. Again, this is very important. Why? Because in this space there's opportunities to again, look at what is happening. And one of the things I wanna offer is for people to really reflect on their institutional practices. My experience as an employee is that oftentimes I found myself as an African-American Muslim male reactively adjusting to the environment, which was, again, this was actually shared, I, I believe by Ling in one of the, no, 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 it wasn't Ling, this was Rachel. Uh, as she shared out uh, about some of the community responses that when you're not part of the mainstream, they talked about this and what they were talking about is reactive adjustment, trying to change yourself to fit within the space. What happens in there is dehumanization or partial personhood. The environment is not ready to receive you as a full person. And so what they offer you is partial personhood. We only would like for this part of you to come into our environment. We are only accepting of this part of you to be in the environment. And this weighs on a person, it weighs on their personhood. And so again, this stripping, these styles and cuts that people experience, that I've experienced, I've experienced this as an employee, these styles and cuts of trying to reactively adjust. The other ways that I've experienced this predominantly um, has been with the institution actively adjusting and so the institution saying, Kasim, we need to change some things about you in order for you to be here. The reactive adjustment process for me as an employee, again, it was very taxing, very psychologically, emotionally draining. And I was the person who was, yeah, I, I have to leave here. This isn't good for me. The active adjustment experiences that I've had with employers they were like, you are not a good fit. You are not adjusting. You are not conforming to meet, again, the cultural needs of the institution. And so in some situations, I've actually been terminated from a position. And I've also had opportunities uh, where the organizations have reactively adjusted. Uh, we're sitting here with Anika, who was my supervisor at, at one time for an organization. And... Uh, I really appreciated how she flexed the space to say, hey, there's some uniquenesses about Kasim that we are not prepared to receive. And we need to kind of shift this environment to hold his personhood together. And in that particular space, what happened was the elevation of healthy relationship. So again, just kind of highlighting these things for us. Um, I could say some more. I'm going to move. I'm going to move a little bit because I don't want to. I'm, I'm looking at the time. Faith, can you take us to the next slide, please? So I have two questions again for you, and these aren't questions that I want necessarily. Well, yeah, I will. In the chat again, I have two questions for you. The first question I have is how many people and listen to my words. I told you uh, I'm fastidious. How many people love love justice. If you love justice, I want you to put a one in the chat. If you do not love justice, I want you to put a zero. 
ones is going crazy. Chris had a point five, okay. Point five, Karen. Nice. One, they fish. Nice. Nice. Look at John getting crafty in here. Zero. Okay. So the second question that I have, again, one in the affirmative, zero in the in the in the in the negative. How many people love love discomfort? I want you to put a one if you love discomfort and a zero if you do not. Point five, let's get weird. Basically, you can learn from it. Point five, point five, point five. Okay, outstanding. All right, this this isn't even part of it, but I'm I'm a social scientist. I love, I love just again just offering and then watching what happens in the in the chat you know what was interesting is to watch people when i said put a one or a zero to watch people put a 0. 0.5 that was phenomenal and the reason why it was phenomenal was because it was like i offered a construct this or that and people said i don't fit within the construct and they offered their individuality that was beautiful now i want us to sit with that that, that wasn't even the point but I want us to sit with that. Why? Because I wonder, I wonder what facilitated that empowerment to say, Kasim, you said one or zero, but I'm going to say 0.5. And I recognize that again, that we are here today with leaders, um, people who have a sense of agency and power within their position. And I wonder if that was connected to this ability to individualize and say, Kasim, I'm actually here. And I wonder if it might be something else. Maybe it's the way that the relationship has been constructed in a short period of time that people felt okay and secure to share something that was not this or that, um, but that people feel on even playing field. And I wonder if this is something that is um, a part of your individual organizations. If you ask these questions, would people give you nuance? Would they give you their individuality or would they feel a, uh, a sense of need to conform to the one or the zero? The reason why I asked these two questions, I, that was just, again, just a noticing, but the reason why I asked these two questions actually is because my belief is that conscious discomfort, conscious discomfort, I'm going into it intentionally to be uncomfortable that that is that is a tax that people pay for doing uncomfortable work um so this diversity equity and inclusion is decades of this work being done and uh in terms of like where we're actually at with it the ability for people to be uncomfortable i would say not because there's not solutions the ability for people to be uncomfortable is really the challenge for actually doing this work. And so in order to be uncomfortable and to be you know, okay with that, to learn to love it, a person has to actually love justice. 
And my belief is that there's no way to love justice without loving discomfort. Why? Because history dictates that there is no justice without discomfort. And so this now becomes conditional. It's a conditional relationship. You will not have justice without discomfort. And so there has to be a love. There has to be a love for discomfort the same way that a person has a love for justice. And what that means is not other people's discomfort, our own discomfort. And so how well have we prepared? Faith, uh, I'm gonna make sure I leave, leave time. Take us to the next slide, please. So solidarity and compassion in the workplace. Uh, these things go a long way and I just wanna offer again, maybe some thoughts. Um, okay, okay, thanks Trish. I want to offer maybe some thoughts or things to consider as we think about solidarity and compassion in the workplace. So this is really about lifting up people's full personhood. Uh, next, next slide, please, Faith. One of the things that I think is, is critical with creating full personhood in the workplace is about creating sacred space. The majority of people living in the Western Hemisphere, their social identity of who they are as an employee holds a lot of weight. It's literally one of the first questions that we ask people when we're out and about socializing. What do you do? Um, it becomes a big part of our social identity. And so the workplace, it should be a space that is sacred. And there's some ways to go about doing that. One is this idea of self-determination. So this is really about the same way that people had this ability to say, I'm going to be a 0.5 and there's no resistance around us. Like, yes, you get to be right there holding people with unconditional positive regard. That is the only way that I am able to do this work of having difficult conversations, doing difficult work, allowing people to be exactly where they're at and move at the pace that they're at is that I'm holding people with unconditional positive regard. I believe people are doing their best at all times. To offer support, not give support, offer support. To hold a non-judgmental stance as we're doing our relationship or interacting and to do things with people, not to them. People feel that experience much more than they can articulate it. People know when things are happening with them versus when they're happening to them. And again, this is about healthy relationship and power dynamics. Allow the people to be the expert on themselves. Every person I interact with, I'm holding them in the light that you are the expert on yourself. So you can tell me what your needs are. You can tell me what is going to benefit you best. And the beauty in holding the person as the expert, I also hold them and allow them to be fallible, which means you get to be the expert, you get to have faults, and you get to get support. And the reality is that that is not particularly the stance that our society holds most people in. Is that you, if you are the expert, you are all knowing you are without fallibility. And the moment you show me fallibility, I will critique it um, in a very harsh and judgmental way. So again, this is about creating sacred space. I will go to the last slide. I believe this is the last slide, Faith. You have done an exceptional job. A last kind of maybe question or thought. The responsibility for leadership. We talked about, again, this mission and vision. One of the things that I've experienced within organizations that I've had the opportunity to be a part of is that the leadership, many organizations, the leadership did not have active working supervision models. The supervision model uh, is again, it's this contractual expectation around how the relationship will happen between leadership and direct reports. It is the thing that helps to facilitate and diffuse power within the relationship. My question is, what is your supervision model? with your organization? Do you have one? Not the one that lives up here, the one that lives in a document that when people are being onboarded, that as the, the supervisor, the director, the manager, that you sit down with your employee and you say, listen, we are great to have you. You've been vetted. You are the person. And here's what our relationship will look like moving forward. And allowing that person to even co-construct part of that relationship. And it is, it's talking about what are the expectations for how I will be here, 
how it will be received and how I can access you as a support. Um, I had some things to present with that, but the reality is I wanted to leave you with a question to say, what is your supervision model? Do you have one? Um, and if not, my guess is, is that when we talk about adjustment, power, if I have power as a leader, and if I haven't, again, balanced that, that power dynamic out by talking about the relationship expectations through my supervision model, now I have a sword that I can wield to hurt and harm people, uh, which is, again, you've done something wrong. Now here comes the, the punitive measures that are part of how I need to correct or adjust for your inability to meet the needs of the institution. Uh, Anika, you can take us away. This is opportunity for questions, comments, concerns, reflections. Thank you so much, Kasim. So we've got a few minutes to process debrief with Kasim. Thank you so much, Kasim, for the, the conversation you've shared. Like I said, when we worked together, um, I learned so much from you just about uh, leaning into that space of discomfort. Um, I watched you effortlessly. I watched you calmly sit in discomfort, even at times when I would try to fix it for you. <laughs> and you'd say, no, 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 we need this space. We need the, and, um, and you would, you would see conflict and discomfort as a space to learn and grow. And I learned that from you. So thank you. Um, I welcome any questions for Kasim. We've got a few minutes. But I would just ask you, uh, until people, until there's questions in there, I would ask you, Kasim, you know, from your perspective, what are the most important things that employers can do right now to create spaces that allow full personhood? Um, it sounds like you're, you're giving us kind of a, um, a route to kind of rethinking how we show up in the space, how leaders show up in the space and how we create those spaces. Are there any other like personal changes that you would recommend that we make or structural changes that you recommend that we make to create those types of spaces? Absolutely. One of the things that I'll again, I'll offer and share, I did not put it as part of the PowerPoint, but it is uh, vitally criti um, critical to the work. Self-awareness, my, my job as a therapist and, and even in the role of consultant, it doesn't matter who I am sitting with as much as it matters how aware I am of self. Um, as a therapist, we, we uh, position ourselves as the instrument. And so the less awareness I have around myself, the more that, again, as power starts to become dynamic in the room, the more I can wield parts of my unconscious self as weapons to hurt and harm people or to diminish people's personhood. And so when I say this conscious discomfort, it's not really about looking within the organization to say, how are other people creating challenges from, no, it's about really leaning into the ideal of self. How aware are you of who you are, your positionality, what's in your backpack and what you're bringing into the space and how that is either helping and uplifting people's personhood or how that may actually be detracting from that process. And so the self-awareness and the relationship to me are the staples um, of doing this work. Thank you. And I'm seeing it's, we are close to coming to a close, but I just wanna remind us and appreciate all the speakers for the, the conversations that you brought forward to us this morning and giving us so much to think about and so much to reflect on um, from beginning, uh, starting us off with a, reminding us of you know, the, the urgency of now and uh, the space that we're in, and even the opportunities that we have as leaders to make a, a difference and to, to create shifts that make a big difference. Um, I wanna also, so thank you to Ling. I wanna thank um, Rachel and Luke for reminding us to meet employees where they are, seeing them as whole people, um, especially the conversation about embracing authenticity um, at least what I heard from that conversation really strongly was as leaders, we need to figure out how to embrace authenticity and to create spaces where people can bring their authentic full selves. Because if we have staff that are feeling isolated, they are going to be the first to leave uh, at the first opportunity. 
Um, also, your rec the recognition of the roots of systemic exclusion and how they still hold today, whether intentional or unintentional, we've got these processes that exclude people and uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to that. And then for Kasim, wrapping it all up and, and bringing us all uh, into a conversation, into our brain and our heart space and thinking about how we can, can think differently and show up, so, show up differently to create spaces to where our organizations are employee ready and employees can thrive and flourish and, and remain um, and develop within our organizations. So thank you all so very much. I appreciate you all. Alyssa shares the, that the book Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbringer Institute speaks to self-awareness as a leader and whole personhood beautifully. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to close us out today. Thank you all. Thank you, Kasim. Thank you, Anika, again, for such a great job and for your stewardship and helping to guide this discussion. Really want to thank all of our presenters who um, laid it down and provided lots of great fruit and uh, understanding and to our sponsors, but most importantly to all of you for being here today. So just appreciate you all. Um, as we move forward, I'm going to take some nuggets from Kasim and I'm going to channel him throughout the rest of the day. But as we think about what is our mission and our vision and what we are here to get and what we are willing to give, those are some foundational things as we think about how we are creating space. What does it mean to live out the mission and vision? What does it mean to get and what are you prepared to give? And it's a, an exchange, it's an environment, it's a <clears throat> process and the humanity of it all, as Kasim explained, is really, really key. Um, and the partial personhood. I think that our challenge today as we move forward to do the work that's needed for change is to be aware as to whether or not we are creating situations where we're only allowing people to exist within their partial personhood. We want to be whole people and we want to be seen and valued as whole people, able to participate fully. And how are we creating those environments so all can thrive and so that we can win. So work ahead, lots to do, lots of great fruit. We will send out the links to the video as well as the PowerPoint presentation. We hope that you have a great day. We hope that you will join us September 23rd and October 14th for our last two sessions. Uh, let's do it and uh, let's be prepared, not just ready. Okay, I'm gonna practice. No, 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 Shannon, really quick, I need to hold you accountable in this space with all these people, so please don't log off 20 seconds. Today is my birthday, and Shannon uh, promised me oh uh, my full, Lord. Full, full, full personhood that I would receive some type of cake or food. <laughs> as an expression of me taking time during my birthday. And so if I don't receive this, I will be sending an all out email to everybody on this list to say, Shannon promised German chocolate. I'm, I'm gonna be baking. Something like that. And so I will be holding you accountable to my personhood uh, with that. So I just want to put that in here so everybody, yes, thank you, thank I'm, you. I'm baking right now. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> I am so sorry. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>